Um, hi folks, I'm Shruti Apia. I am a research scientist with Block Science for Link Crypto Economic Models. And over there, I'm primarily interested in mathematical modeling of um, economic systems in such a way that we can actually eventually simulate them, but also find the sensitivities of the system. And I am also helping build a Haskell-based domain-specific language for financial instruments. Awesome. Um, and um, Sunny. Oh, we're doing a, a quick one-liner intro of us because this is our first research workshop. But Sunny has been an OG in the Flash Boss discussions, Treasure Map Roast. So, uh, but this one is uh, this workshop is specifically research focused. If you can actually speak. Well, looks like Sunny may not necessarily be able to speak, but um, so Saria. Do you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I'm a PhD student right now with uh, Andrew Miller. Um, my current research is largely in sort of uh, UC stuff, uh, so just on the side of cryptography and security. But uh, in the past, I've done um, blockchain research in, uh, in largely in payment channels and just sort of had my hand around in a few different security papers as well. And uh, yeah, I'm also I'm also slightly new to the Black Box uh, ship. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. Um, I think the number that's calling in is Dave because his um, connection wasn't good. So Dave, want to do a one, two line intro of your research direction and yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, sorry about internet not working. Uh, I'm currently more interested in how we best mitigate borrowing uh, time. You can if you like to do problems with them. No, I'm really like research outside of it. Yeah, sorry, Dave, you're muted. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if it's my internet connection or yours. You seem to be breaking up. But if anyone's breaking up, feel free to text in the chat chat box um, for um, anything. I think it was feedback with your mic, Tina. So I think you might have to mute yourself while Dave talks. At least uh, that was my understanding of what <laughs> Google was showing. My apologies, guys. <laughs> but it's surely my side being weird right now, uh, going through a phone. No, now that sounds great. <laughs> okay, I should do the intro again. Uh, I guess uh, I'm interested in how to best mitigate MEV if we can change the base layer consensus algorithm, and uh, as well, uh, I'm interested in like you know working on recursive snarks. That's what I do as research outside of MEV stuff. Cool. Awesome. All right. So um, let's go. Uh, so I have uh, shared a bit of an agenda to guide our discussion. So this is um, Flash Boss has been in existence for um, our uh, research discussion has been going on for essentially three, four months. And um, we have started um, um, with our Flash Boss research um, proposal process, FRP process. Um, and the submission is um, uh, will be due next Sunday. So um, this call is our first research focused workshop that um, will go into discussing the FRPs that has been um, submitted according to the Flashbots research roadmap. For most of you who have um, uh, attended our roast in the past, you will know that um, um, this just uh, go to Flashbots um, MEV research repo. Uh, the README section um, and the docs linked. Hi, Dan. Um, we'll have everything that you need to know about how to contribute and be part of the Flashbots research. Um, and the FRP process, uh, basically, um, the deadline will be next Sunday. And then the week after, we will um, basically announce our grants that we uh, uh, will uh, uh, reward our MEV fellows who are the grant recipients who have submitted the FRPs. So yeah, once again, everything is in the link that I just also shared uh, with you is in our GitHub repo. 
That said, um, I think we uh, we just saw uh, Dan Moroz joining. Uh, some of us here are already familiar with Dan's work. Dan uh, is taking a sabbatical from um, Harvard, but um, Dan, do you want to do a uh, you know quick intro, like one or two lines about your area of research? Oh sure. Um, hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sure. So um, I'm a PhD student at Harvard um, with David Parks, and the group I'm in is called the Econ CS group. And typically, they've studied um, mechanism design, uh, but at a larger scale than what's studied in Econ. So typically, in Econ, um, the auctions, you know, that they come up with, and that that field originated in Econ, and so there's a continuation of that in the computer science literature and there's like whole conferences you know essentially based on this like um, like EC and wine and so on um, so I've kind of taken that approach and um, thought about cryptocurrencies in that light so how kind of cryptocurrency and uh, and the kind of game theoretic dynamics that occur you know like mining and like mining pools and like staking and so on and so I've written I've had some papers where we talk about um, models of that and the kind of incentives of the different players and the equilibria that result and the issues you know that we see in all this. So MEV is definitely uh, up this alley. Very excited to be here. Awesome. So. Um I think uh, just a couple of uh, quick updates um, as we go down to uh, go through the agenda. One is we have made a modification to the uh, to the FRP template, minor modification that uh, Alejo has submitted a PR um, and we have merged it. So Alejo, can you make a, a, a share screen and kind of a, just uh, go through what has changed in the FRP process? Sure, it's a very minor change actually. Um, so before there was actually no separate um, uh, template. So I just essentially split the template and modified it a little bit. Let me uh, find my screen. Uh, there we go. Can you see my screen? Oops. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so yep. this is the this is the research repo. Um, so before uh, in the this is the just introduction uh, Tina was mentioning before, and then in the roadmap there was a section where they were um, some guidelines on what makes a, a, a successful uh, FRP. Where is it now? Uh, oh, I it's in uh, FRP 1 or FRP... Uh, ah, sorry, yeah. It was inside the FRPs, in the FRP 0, sorry about that. Here there was a, what belongs to a successful FRP, so it had a small section with uh, guidelines on how to build it. I thought it was useful to actually put it this in a template, and so I, I did a quick template. Whoops. Okay. Uh, I, com I, I uh, got the wrong links. I have to fix that. Um, so it's clearly... So it's a simple template uh, that one can simply copy and fill in the, the different sections. This will work as a, so this is a little table with information, summary of the project, uh, and then background and problem statement, uh, plan and deliverables, and a references section. Again, this is model I repeated after what was there, so no major changes, but I think it was useful to have like a separate file so people can simply copy that and build upon that. Yeah, I will fix that link. Perfect. Um, so, um, and so that uh, so that's uh, the the template that we um, uh, will reference. Um, I think it fits most of the research questions here. Um, second uh, brief update is um, we have uh, so basically uh, we have uh, 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 Mika who is also an editor for EIP process, uh, raise a comment about uh, our authorship, um, that we uh, originally abide by authorship, which requires submission of your credentials and et cetera. Um, however, um, he, I think he made a good point about um, 
anonymous contributors being acceptable. So I think uh, we should uh, broaden the the the, the guide uh, the, should broaden the the criteria to accept um, anonymous contributors rather than having to essentially quote unquote KYC um, research contributors. So that's just uh, something that um, I think a slight update that I think would be uh, beneficial for everyone here to know. But uh, I think everyone who actually joined the call are happy to be not anonymous contributors here. But anyways, that said, um, we'll continue. Um, uh, and third, um, I guess more, uh, more or less administrative update is that we're finalizing our setup uh, our uh, FRP editors. FRP editors will have the responsibility of actually be actively involved in reviewing, reviewing, um, and discuss with the research fellows, um, and uh, to help uh, make sure that the uh, our FRPs can fit into the broader scope of the context, and they're not contradicting each other too much on in terms of methodologies, etc. So I think the current FRP editors that we're proposing, the set is um, uh, Alejo. Um, and Georgios, um, uh, who is not on this call at this moment, um, and uh, uh, and Phil, um, and uh, Alex and uh, Alex Abadia and, and myself will be assisting everyone in the coordination process. Um, so uh, that said, um, let's move on to the research questions and the FRPs that has been proposed. So if everyone here can go on the flashbots. GitHub or Alejo, you may um, share your skin, uh, screen, um, and um, in the MR, uh, MEV research repo, um, you will uh, and if we um, actually go to the paper one and paper two, the research questions. What we have seen is that we have uh, received two draft um, um, uh, FRPs, one from Surya and one from um, author. Um, they're not yet. Uh, they're still in draft, so they're not yet updated in the um, in the flashbots repo. Um, however, as we are going through these drafts with each team, perspect uh, respectively, we start to realize that we definitely, um, and this is actually also intentional. We left the research questions very vague and potentially have overlapping um, uh, between the research questions. So we need to actually fine tune this. Uh, uh, you know, a bit more um, in terms of our research questions. And so um, basically all the research questions that we have put forth is in the MEV research repo readme. And um, perhaps, um, Alejo, you can discuss a bit about what you have observed in the current our FRP submitted, and then we can go into the each of the FRPs. Yeah, sure. So we work with Surya uh, this week in part. So FRP one uh, was a bit of a blanket FRP. It had many things in there. So we uh, worked in breaking that up in in smaller, more manageable chunks. I don't know, Surya, do you want to show that, or do you want me to? Uh, that's still not in the repo. So, oh, if you could just share share your own screen, that'd be easier. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, fine. So this is still in Surya's repo. Let me get that. Um, uh, just a sec. Um, Although I will have, I, I will add a, add a caveat that from my call with Alejo on Monday, it's still in a very rough form, so it hasn't been updated just yet. So, but yeah. You know, yeah. You can at least get the idea of yeah I think more of yeah just look at the titles so we we essentially broke it down live in a call so we haven't like polished this after that so before the frp1 just for a little context this was uh how can we build a, a good auction strategy right so this was uh uh, it had like questions of uh, measuring mev and and questions of designing the auction so and it had many different things bundling that uh, so this is the the old title the how can we build a good auction mechanism so we broke it up in small chunks i think this perhaps should be not sub frps but frps on on their own we can discuss that so first first one is actually building a taxonomy of extraction strategies right so uh, right now we have liquidations we have arbitrage and so on and so forth so uh, one early step in the process is um 
just like um, uh, describing this taxonomy of, of strategies more properly. This will be very uh, closely linked to what MEV Inspect does in, in crawling the blockchain and finding these opportunities. Uh, second is measuring PGAs and other MEV extraction strategies. Um, again, this is what uh, MEV Inspect does. We have to define what exactly we want to, to measure and, and this will depend a little bit on what the taxonomy uh, uh, we, we define in, in this sub FRP. This was a big part of what was uh, there in the in the FRP one. Um, so that's something we uh, need to refine better what things we, we want to measure and go ahead and measure them. Um, this third one was uh, separating layer one versus layer two. This is related to Carl Froer's post in ETH research. If any of you have seen that, he was proposing perhaps doing the the uh, reordering of transactions as a layer two thing. So Surya is going to talk with with Carl about this. So this is something we also want to look into. Um, FRP 14 or four or whatever we end up uh, numbering it is um, about the meaning of good in the good auction mechanism. So first, there's a uh, good applying to different actors. So there's uh, bidders, uh, miners, and external users that are perhaps impacted by I don't know gas prices going uh, down. So this is one thing we want to. Uh, define what good is uh, for each of the, the actors in the system and, and try to come up with a sharper, sharper, um, uh, more measurable operational definition of good. Is this like uh, this in, we, we discussed before, this involves a notion of efficiency and it probably involves other things. It's clearly less geared towards good in an ethical sense. And that's uh, more the focus of paper two, where uh, I want to make sure we're doing something good for the ecosystem. This is more tied to how, like a notion of like again efficiency, optimality, and so on of the um, of the the auction mechanism we want to incorporate in the in the system. So again, this is is to be defined how the different how what this good means in operational terms and how this integrates the the good that's good for differently good for each each of the actors of the of the system. Um, next, oops, next one is uh, finding solutions to the objecting functions. This is FRP 1.3, but be, because we renumber, this should be FRP 1.4. So, and once we have like a notion of what's good, okay, what's the solution that optimizes that that good? What's what's uh, the actual auction mechanism that achieves this this notion of of good, right? Um, so, this is a, a again a design mechanism design thing. Um, FRP 1.6, uh, sorry, and this is very much related to FRP, uh, I call it 1.7, or I think it was originally number six, that was that one Surya was working on, that it's about um, surveying the literature, the auction literature, and see what actual uh, auction mechanisms are already known, what are their properties, so what can we uh, possibly use for, for, for this. Um, finally, FRP 1.6 is, uh, where is the, our current POC, uh, proof of concept, uh, auction mechanism standing in terms of this, this ideal or this, 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 this solution we, we find for the, this idea of good? Uh, so where are we standing in terms of that? We are now using a sealed bid first price auction for the MEV guest proof of concept. So how good is that? How bad is that? How, how it compares with uh, more promising solutions eventually? Um, we, we don't know uh, what the status is, so this is one thing we want to uh, dig deeper into. Um, yeah, so that's the the and six sub FRPs that could potentially become FRPs. We are working into trying to parse this big, uh, big, very ample uh, question into some like smaller, more tractable chunks. And again, these are um, sort of up for grabs. We still have not like assigned people to to this, so. That's also a good place where we can uh, find uh, uh, people to contribute to. Any questions? One thing, on, one yeah. thing I, will, I will also add to that, Alejo, is that I Please. think if, like if we get some research fellows who, who are essentially a team of people, I think the, I think in that case, a lot of those FRPs can become bind into a single one, and you know, a, a, a whole team. I think is well equipped to handle them sort of in parallel, yeah.
Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, you know presenting essentially the um, uh, breaking down of the research questions um, and so uh, into the sum of our piece. We definitely um, uh, like we'll come up with a better numbering system. Um, but I just want to hear before we go to the next FRP. Uh, from a uh, draft uh, that author um, and his team has put together. Um, questions on on the way we set or sectioning um, the research questions and dividing things up. I think there are a lot of questions, and we have, uh, as we have uh, discussed individually, one on ones with the researchers who have been joining the calls in the past. Um, there's definitely questions on certain research questions deserve to be standalone. Um, paper uh, where they're only like uh, you know uh, a page or two would not be able to do justice especially paper one question three and pay and also the other uh, comment that we have got a lot which is um, FR, uh, the first paper really 80% of the meat of the paper is in the first research question uh, which is uh, that's why we're doing the breakdown of it and that's why we're having these research workshops to make sure that we are going to be able to um, select the research fellows who are interested in solving these questions collectively with us um, in a meaningful way. So that's why we're also ad adjusting our process um, to accommodate this. But that's the context, and I want to hear what everyone thinks. Your audio is not the greatest, or, for Tina, but I think we heard most of it. Maybe in a tropical storm, I think. <laughs> sounds sounds like it. <laughs> Have you considered not being in a tropical storm? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That all sounds good to me. Uh, did you find that there would be any tools or organization that would be helpful to your first FRP, Surya and Alejo, I guess, while we wait for Tina to resume the program? I'm kind of curious about that. So I think one thing I was interested in is, um, I think Alejo brought this up in the in our call was, so how does, so how is the, how is the the sort of MEV opportunities that frontrun.me can find and report? How do they compare to MEV Inspect? And further, for MEV Inspect, sort of how can we think about how much about about how much extractable MEV that MEV Inspect reports? In the sense that, is it close to maybe a lower bound? Is it close to an upper bound? Like how many of the MEV opportunities are being are being missed by MEV Inspect, or how much, uh, what percent is being captured by it? Yeah, so I think that's something we also set Stefan and Scott on the engineering side on a mission to try to quantify. So maybe it would be worth also chatting with them and seeing if they have any metrics. Um, mm -hmm. Run.me, I can tell you real quick, was just like very specifically only atomic dex trades that profited mm -hmm. the arbitrager in ETH, okay. um, only on like five or six different DEXs that are mentioned in the paper. So that's like a very small subset. I expect the real upper bound is way higher. And it also doesn't consider like reorderings or anything. It's just using like bot profit as a proxy for MEV. Mm -hmm. uh, but really like the miners could probably make more if they were actively reordering and things like that, which I think we might also want to capture in the dashboard. Um, so, yeah, so it's fair to say that, that it's probably um, somewhere near a lower bound on yeah, it's definitely a lower bound, but it's it's a pretty bad lower bound. Yeah, um, because the miners could profit at least that much for sure, but it's mm -hmm. pretty bad. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think adding coverage is one of the main things we we still need to do on that side. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that like it's worth thinking about in general, like how do we encourage sustainable research artifacts, and maybe that's like packaging things up in a way that can be um, can can be contributed to engineering and kicked over later. And establishing a process where they like actually do that, um, mm -hmm. but I think that's one of the things we're really bad at as academics. And like, Frontrun.me is an example where like, yeah. if it takes like a hundred hours to like update your thing to like the newest industry trends or whatever, like you're probably not going to be incentivized to do that. So yeah. And then yeah, on the on the 
topic yeah. of uh, of coverage, I wanted to also ask: um, is there is there kind of a running list a list of like what MEV strat extraction strategies are covered right now in MEV inspect, and sort of which ones uh, you are trying to also cover, or, or at least just some some sort of enumeration of like the of the main strategies you, you guys have uh, come up with. Yeah, I think it's worth chatting with them about that because I think they have something internal, but it's probably not rigorous. So okay. like part of what I think it's good for the research side to do is like if you find a question like this that like people are working on on the engineering side that's relevant, just like guiding them towards giving you data that's like more rigorous and can be used for like, you know, a survey or like some sort of more uh, public kind of formal release rather than just like yeah. internal notes. Uh, because I feel like we have most of the data, but there's just like, some covered stuff that needs to happen that I'm sure you guys can help guide and also other people on this call can help guide. Gotcha. Sorry, I didn't want to derail your call, Tina. I'll hit them up. <laughs> continue oh. continue the agenda, please. <laughs> or uh, our uh, I just have one remark to make. I, I, I need to hop off to another call, but um, it seems like the all of the FRPs except FR, FR, FRP11 have the dependency on that FRP11, which is establishing the taxonomy and notations around um, what what we're building with, with MVV extraction strategies. So are we expecting this to be sequential, given that there's dependency, or are we expecting that all of these related topics will have different notations, or how is that going to work? Is there going to be an integration mechanism? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, not necessarily, I think not necessarily, as a, they don't mean necessarily uh, sequential, so one, uh, so, for instance, all the problem of what's good, how to define good in terms of like in more operational terms and and good for each of the actors. I think that can run in parallel to defining the taxonomy. That's more like the good thing is more dependent on the on the available. So there's defining good, and then the uh, the survey of the auction mechanisms available, and then finding the optimal. Those are sort of kind of related in a blob, and then. And then there's the one on the taxonomy and then measuring and those two are certainly related. So yeah, that's it's cl there's clearly some structure to mm -hmm. those and some like uh, uh, dependencies we can we can uncover. And yeah, that's a good point. We should make those explicit. But, but I, 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 I do expect some things to be able to, to be mm -hmm. run in parallel. I would also say that okay, I awesome. think at least uh, trying to enumerate and classify MEV, I think um, based on what Based on what Phil just said, I think talking to the engineering team and sort of getting getting an access to their internal notes would go a long way in completing that FRP, just in terms of being able to then move forward without, you know, having it be a blocker. Yeah. So so far, so uh, from the just from the code of MEV inspect, it's there is some sort of uh, taxonomy. They're like operational taxonomy, and it's more like bottoms up. Of, okay, compound. We know we have to look at compound, and there's a compound inspector, and there's okay, Ave. We need to look at Ave, and there's an Ave. So it's more of like a spontaneously building taxonomy. So I think our our job would be to try to uh, organize that and and try to make sense out of that, and see if we can like uh, have something more hierarchical or or to to give some more more structure there. Uh, there, there was one comment I I uh, talking with Scott, looking at the architecture. I think there inference mechanism is sort of uh, there's an inference of like okay this is an mev extraction opportunity and i think that certainly could be could be improved uh, in particular i think there's occasions in which uh, it might be detecting things that are not mev extractions just by the way it works so i've detected like one very corner corner case like where zapper uh, zapper liquidity provision so liquidity provision via zapper is classified as an mev extraction event again because of how this inference work uh, so i think that's super tricky because if we want to make uh, strong claims out this being a lower bound ta -ta -ta, uh, at some point we really have to look at that and be a bit more strict in how we we tag things as mev extraction events and so on. i think again i agree with what phil was saying that there needs to be some interaction uh, with the engineering team to define that yeah, I think that's they're good. very... That's good. like the starting point. Sorry yeah. for going. No, no problem. And feel free. I don't want to keep you too long if you have to get to your other call. Uh, but yeah, I think that's all That's all sane. And I also think the engineering team has like expressed that they very much want guidance on that front. And like, you know, systematizing that, I think, is a very useful research objective in general. 
Well, I have a quick question for um, F FRP12. So this is basically this inspector. Uh, so is the goal here to just be passive in the sense of detecting past MEVs? Or would there be a goal of detecting the potential MEVs that are out there, right? Because these are two different things. Uh, so for example, if you want to detect all the arbitrage MEVs that are out there, then you basically need to detect all the arbitrage opportunities among all the DeFi platforms, which is a very different problem from just observing what do other people do? And we want to measure what other people do, right? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So I can give you my high level vision of what it was. And I, it's, by no means is this like necessarily what will happen, but just the way I was thinking about it was that like, at first we would kind of provide a portal to maximize transparency of what bots are doing, just because that's like a concrete tangible thing that plays into all of our metrics of like, how much MEV is there and how much gas is being wasted. Um, eventually, I would also like to have almost like a contest style API where maybe you can submit like MEV solutions for like a block or a range of blocks that's like better than the order that was actually executed. And then we like archivally validate the legitimacy of those kind of contest um, entries and kind of also talk about maximum pass MEV for various interesting sequences and single blocks. Um, and eventually, I think like the whole Flashbots infrastructure of like, if there's actual MEV being extracted through this infrastructure should also like automatically feed into that. We're like, if it's extracted, it should feed into like, okay, this is the best known solution for this block. Um, but also potentially when you're testing strategies, you can also submit to the public that like, oh, actually this would have been better for a pass block. Um, because also, as we mentioned, like, we expect MEV for even like a fixed block to be like somewhat super linear in time because like the longer you have to solve the problem, probably the better instances you're going to find. Uh, so people probably will at some point, if the game gets really crazy, be like, oh, a year ago, you really could have done this strategy and like it would have been way more profitable. So I think that was the at least the vision. But uh, obviously, there's a lot of work that needs to happen between nice. there and now. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, um, I feel the only reason being that starting from the point of like, we want to get all the MEV in the past is like very hard to do. And this is like much lower hanging fruit. And I think we can iteratively advance to like the ultimate MEV kind of dashboard, hopefully. Yeah, so I think um, actually, uh, Shruti raised a really important point that I think um, has been a blocker from both of Flashbots engineering, um, a Flashbots inspect side, uh, in terms of uh, uh, what is a uh, you know good taxonomy, um, you know um, to in fact guide them uh, in data collection, and also this is something that I think came up in our conversation one on one conversation with um, uh, authors team uh, when they are drafting their FRP, they have posted an FRP on quantifying MEV um, uh, from uh, uh, impact on. Uh, uh, on the uh, uh, protocol security. Uh, per, uh, and, and that is a paper two question. However, um, they picked a subset, um, which is liquidation, that is currently not um, being collected by the Flashbots uh, uh, engineering team from MEV Inspect uh, for various reasons that uh, have been shared uh, in the core dev calls. However, it's worthwhile to bring it up here. So, author, would you like to share um, a bit on? Uh, of your uh, uh, yeah, of, of course. Um, let me see. Should I share my screen? That's might make things easier. Uh, I never use Google. Um, hang on, one second. Sorry for that delay. Oh, seems I have to kid and reopen to give random permissions to the... I will be back in a second. Sounds good. And um, while authors rejoining, uh, one thing I want to point out is also that 
So uh, we have also had this discussion with Sunny and Dave, who's also on this call, uh, from protocol designer perspective, and um, that they um, essentially uh, the taxonomy of MEV and also like quantifying the empirical MEV extraction versus the theoretical limits. Uh, that is something that is uh, potentially need to be addressed. Um, but okay, cool. I'm trying to share here a specific window. Can you see? Yep. Yes. EFRP, or is it too big? Maybe, maybe zoom a little bit more. Can you see it? Yep. Oh, no, sorry. Sorry, it seems I'm struggling a bit with the... Is it now clear? Yep, still a little small if you just zoom in maybe the Google I or the Control Plus like um, let me check why that's the case if not it's fine I think we can we can yep. deal we can read it yeah it looks fine on my end I can zoom in on my screen oh, now I now I hear you again sorry about this can you hear me yeah I was just saying if you zoom in a little bit it would be a little better but it's okay if you can't oh of course um, like this perfect yeah, yeah that's perfect awesome so that's a very coarse draft, obviously. Uh, but the idea is to study uh, in the first step liquidations. Um, we have looked a bit into the liquidation platform. So there's Aave, Compound, UDX, and probably MakerDAO. I think collectively they they represent roughly over 80% of the lending markets. Um, so by, by capturing them, we would basically capture yeah, about 80% of the lending markets. Um, and because of the liquidation proceeds, they contribute quite massively to mine extractable value. Um, the liquidation mechanisms in RV Compound and DYDX are uh, not auction based, but they are like uh, based on a fixed spread liquidation. This means uh, in RV, once uh, once the debt uh, passes the health factor, so goes below beyond, uh, below one uh, of the health factor, then any liquidator can come in and liquidate uh, parts of the collateral. Now, it depends a bit of how much they can liquidate. Uh, I think on RV and Compound, the close factor, which is the percentage, the fraction of what they can liquidate is 50%. On uh, DYDX is even 100%. So this is quite um, lender or borrower unfriendly, I would say, and liquidator friendly, right? If you can liquidate almost 100% of the collateral, although it might be sufficient to just liquidate 5% to, to secure the debt. Um, so, yeah, and we have seen recent price or record manipulations. Well, it's debatable whether these are benign or malicious manipulations, but um, there's, I mean, there's basically a fact that liquidators uh, yield significant profits, right? Um, over over all these three platforms. So ideally we want to systematiz systematically measure what's what's the current state in DeFi liquidations and, and what's the current mechanism. There are already some works that have looked at compound, I think, but I don't think they're as deep as we want them to be. So there's I think that the space is quite yeah broad to be explored. Um, and ultimately it would be interesting to know whether we can and they, or recommend, for example, to the lending platforms a liquidation mechanism that is anti-MEV, right? If you can find like, um, if if you can find a liquidation mechanism that is maybe friendlier for the borrowers, well, it would necessarily be a bit unfriendlier for liquidators because in the end it's, it's a zero-sum game. But uh, ideally, we want to find some liquidation mechanisms that prevents MEV, right? Um, in in some way. So. 
there are a few questions we want to engage in, like very simple engineering questions at the beginning. What's the monthly accumulated liquidation profit for the different platforms? Um, how competitive are these liquidations, right? Basically just analyzing the gas prices, plotting a nice distribution of the of the different um, methods over the whole spectrum of the, the whole time frame. Um, what are the different liquidation mechanisms, methods, right? Um, and how do they differ with respect to MEV? And yeah, as I said, which liquidation mechanisms avoid MEV? Um, uh, if we quantify how sensitive current debts are to liquidation, then we know how, by how much an adversary would need to manipulate an or a price oracle in order to trigger liquidation, in order to trigger MEV. So if a miner is an MEV or a miner, and he knows that there's, I don't know, 100 million um, of collateral that is about to be liquidated if the price just drops by 5%, well, they might do just push it over the edge, right? And then they can anticipate that there will be some MEV. Um, so um, sensitivity of, of, of collateral to liquidation might be relevant. So there are a few related works. I'm sure we missed a few. Um, that's why this is just a very early draft. And um, so we we discussed um, with the Flashbots team before because we wanted to also quantify how MEV impacts on blockchain security. We think that we will we will uh, separate this into in a separate FRP because it actually it, it actually matters to all sources of um, of uh, MEV. Um, so. The second FRP would be how can we quantify? Um, let's say let's say there's an MEV opportunity right, that ar arrives. Uh, there's an MEV aware miner, but this MEV aware miner somehow doesn't manage to mine this transaction. And let's say some other miner or some other trader manages to mine this MEV. Now, um, how big does this MEV opportunity need to be for this MEV aware miner to start forking the chain? So, is it enough if the MEV opportunity surpasses like 10 times the block reward. Does this already mean that the, um, that the, that the miner will start, like a rational miner will start forking the chain, right? Basically doing selfish mining, build a private chain that he doesn't publish, and at, at some point when he's lucky enough, he, he, he overrides the, the public chain. So this is, this is a second um, FRP that, that we initially had in here, yeah, but after consultations with yeah. the team, it's going to be a good time. It's going to be a grand old time. Good to have you. Okay, cool. Um, so obviously there are, there are three plots and figures that should come out of this, and uh, the systemization of different liquidation mechanisms. Ide ideally, actually, uh, what uh, liquidation um, mechanisms are anti-MEV, right? Uh, some, some concrete some concrete recommendations on that end. Yeah. yeah, that all sounds super interesting. I think those are all important questions. I also wonder, like, are there any inherent trade-offs in, like, anti-MEV liquidations? Um, like, how low, do you need some MEV to keep the system running efficiently? And, like, how low and, like, what are the trade-offs when you approach that minimum point, um, I think would be interesting. Like, I kind of, think about it in a similar way as like AMMs where like AMMs really only work because of MEV and like even though they're pretty inefficient, people like the UX so much that like they're willing to expose some MEV but they don't want it to be too much. So like how do we think about the trade-offs of like reducing MEV and like how does that change when it goes to the extreme of like approaching zero I think is interesting. Yeah, we also don't want to give no money to the liquidators, right? Otherwise, they, they wouldn't like secure the system if it needs to be secured. So it, it's really, it, it's quite a challenging uh, uh, game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for sharing, Arthur. Um, I think uh, it will be actually very interesting. Uh, we're very in interested to see how you split the two questions and how you develop this current FRP and how you split the uh, research question uh, into two FRPs. Um, so yeah, would love to follow up on the uh, on the update here. Um, I think uh, w once again, one of the uh, perhaps the next step with regard to the liquidations uh, for the study on liquidations is to goes back to the taxonomy question. It goes back to kind of how do we um, systematically quantify uh, MEV. Um, 
uh, I think perhaps deserves a, um, you know, uh, a separate call with uh, the Flashbots um, engineering team who is collecting a da uh, different data set that's not overlapping with your team's uh, data collection. Because I believe that author, um, your team is planning to um, uh, separately collect the data on on this uh, for this study. Correct. Yeah, this was yeah. This was our initial idea. I mean, because we we have some experience with Geth, with Geth, and uh, we have full archive node in Geth and so on. Um, so we, we do have this, like a base level of infrastructure that that would help. But obviously, if the more synergies we can create, the better for everyone, right? So um, that's to be seen. Cool. Well, um, Alejo, do you have any um, uh, questions or suggestions on this matter? Uh, on on this particular FRP and FRP that will break up. No, I, I what I what we discussed the other day in the in the, I think it's great that you split this into two different uh, things. Uh, now I uh, yeah I think the challenge here is how this interacts with the um, with the taxonomy we will eventually build and the question that was asked before. Okay, is this like dependent on the taxonomy we build? Is it like should we look at uh, liquidations? Uh, on their own, or should we try to tackle like uh, measuring the MEV in across the taxonomy? So this is like the main the main question to me. If we if we tackle uh, separately liquidations from other uh, ways of extracting MEV, uh, I think the challenge there is coordinating everything in a in a in a way that all the the deliverables are sort of uh, aligned that we're measuring the same thing essentially, right? So I think that's the main. So one approach is to have like separate teams uh, measure each of these um, opportunities separately and then do a coordination effort to try to make sure that uh, we're all measuring the same thing in the same way. Um, otherwise, uh, the other approach would be to uh, have perhaps a larger team cover uh, the, the the entire taxonomy and measure um, the uh, all, all the things there. But again, uh, it's also dependent a little bit on the, on the how, when, when when and how we find that that taxonomy. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, happy to to continue discussing, right? I mean, this, as you said, right, this could also be like a, a small section or like a small part of this FRP one, I believe, that does measure everything, right? That would be also be fine. I mean, whatever fits better, the the group. Sounds great. Um. I think one thing to clarify is that the uh, FRP process is meant to discover um, what is within limit, uh, by defining the scope, um, we can come up with answerable questions and that we will have owners for each of the answerable questions to, uh, so that we can, um, uh, through this collective research process, we can uh, arrive at the um, general deliverables. But of course, each of these research questions deserve a lot more time and energy put into it. So a lot of them deserve to be a standalone paper, perhaps uh, once we actually um, gone through the collective research uh, process. Uh, and I'm sure Phil has a lot more to say on this, but I want to move on to, um, to uh, the third question in paper one, which is currently under address and we have received um, um, questions and good, good questions on what the third question should be, which is on uh, MEV on alternative architecture. Um, so the question is not very well defined yet at this point. So like, um, I don't know whether um, Sunny and Dave, um, you guys now have stable connections, can share a bit of your thoughts in this regard. Um, yeah, I... So I mean, what I was thinking about this question is the, I mean, so, so I was also thinking that this seems a bit an odd fit for like this paper, because this paper is mostly about the architecture of this design. But I feel like the way to go about like um, showing what, or, like even thinking about like what does this fit in other architectures is like to you know, start with the null hypothesis that like this art, this design, like the, the auction design and everything works in other architectures and then like disprove that by designing architecture, like chain architectures that don't, this, 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 uh, this auction design doesn't work in. And so, you know, I think the two, I mean, so, you know, 
Dave and I are design like we mentioned. Dave and I were design are designing one chain architecture in like BFT in, in a BFT case that with like threshold decryption and stuff that like we think that this auction design doesn't work in. Um, but then you know there's probably other ones that you can explore as well. Like you know Avalanche team claims that like their leaderless consensus protocol also makes the auction design not work. And so I feel like before you can even start to answer like like what it means like how you would design this system and others change I, th I think like the first thing would be to just keep exploring as many like trying to design as many architectures as you can in which this auction design doesn't work and so yeah that, that, that right. that's kind of like what I'm thinking is like if you wanted to answer that question that's probably the way you'd go about doing it and it just feels a little bit out of a little bit like different than the rest of the paper um, for that reason. Cause it's like, it's more it's also, of a design problem more than a like evaluation problem almost. It's also not that the uh, auction mechanism doesn't work. It's more so that uh, the auction mechanism is like suboptimal. And if you have a different base layer, you can do more optimal things. Like EG, you know, if you do the auction, you know, with an SGX, you get some security properties, but SGXs aren't optimal. But given constraints of being on Ethereum, you can't really do that much better. But now if we examine other systems, e.g. You know, I don't know, Tenement stock census where you have BFT with a fixed threshold for liveness, you can do, you get new solution types. If you do uh, an avalanche, maybe get something new as well. I don't, I actually understand avalanche well enough to have a cogent thing to say there. So I think the latter might be an interesting, like give it, Suppose, suppose another arc, a base layer type. What can we do there? Or what's the optimal we can aim for there? Or what's other like security guarantees we can aim for? I'm not sure if the, how much, to what degree you're going to get any nice level of abstraction across different base layer types though. Like, uh, like so at least in for when you have a BFT consensus, the threshold for liveness, it feels, among things I know at the moment, it seems like you know threshold signatures are the are threshold encryption is the best, but it doesn't seem like it's going to hold for a proof of work, or a, yeah proof of work chain or like avalanche. So I don't know if there's any abs like nice abstraction layer to get, other than you're just a, a summary table, but. Uh. Yeah, uh, I would love to hear um, Phil's uh, and Alejo's thoughts on this. Hi, uh, Davis. Good to see you. <laughs> um, so, so um, I guess this is a, a question directly directed to uh, research question number three on paper one. Sorry, what was the question again? I'm uh, like also working on a paper deadline and kind of zoning in and out. Uh, not that I'm not listening, but I don't know the concrete question. Um, I think uh, to uh, perhaps Sunny uh, Sunny's uh, question kind of sum, summed it up uh, pretty well. In how do we frame question research question number three so it actually is a meaningful is meaningful to uh, uh, to the paper one which uh, mostly focuses on flashbots architecture or maybe um, Alejo you have a better way of framing uh, 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 Sunny and Dave's question. Yeah, I, th I think that that. Point makes sense that like it is a little bit of its own thing. Um, I think it does relate to paper one, and you know I don't necessarily think the papers have to be like a religious organizing metric. And like paper one could just call out the fact that this is an issue because I do think it's like somewhat relevant to what what our system will eventually do if we want to like respond to these changes um, that people will probably make in other, especially in other chains. Um, so I think it'll probably be relevant to mention in paper one, whether it's going to be like super under paper one, like, I don't know. Um, like I'm, I think that will naturally evolve if you guys are interested in taking that and reorganizing it or someone else's, um, you know, I think that's also sane. Um, but I don't think we were going to do a super, at least my intention when I originally wrote that document was not to be super deep in paper one. 
uh, and kind of like leave it as a future work for like a next paper, which I think is consistent with what you're suggesting is uh, the best way to approach it. Mm -hmm. Any... is, my, is my understanding of that clear? Because I, I think I got all the concerns, but I just want to make sure that I'm actually addressing the question. Yeah, uh, I think that that's um, a high level, uh, definitely. I think it's still, um, it's uh, like we're trying to find a solution in terms of like what is the depth that we go into in terms of uh, alternative base layer, like, or and what is the worthwhile question that actually pertains to auction mechanism design for MED auction, um, which is what paper one is about, right? So essentially, I think it's like, I, I guess perhaps to pro throw a proposal out there, but I, uh, once again, I want to hear more from Dan, from uh, you know, author, from you know, uh, everyone else on this call, from the label specifically. So I see like I heard perhaps a survey of alternative litter, uh, uh, sorry, alternative architecture, um, and what MTV. Uh, Your audio is really bad again, Tina. Oh, slowly. Um, well, maybe um, can someone else uh, take over my vocal? Uh, I'll just type my my question. <laughs> so I, I guess one question I had was like, how what what level of detail like w detail of this question of this answer would go in favor? Of what is it like? You know, it, we could just say like, does this art th does the uh, flashbots design work on all chain architectures? And you know, we could just try to answer that simply like that. Or, you know, we could take it a step further and say, like, okay, well, provide an examples of uh, architectures where it doesn't work. Okay, we could do that. Or we could be, like, even more detailed, like, explain why it doesn't work in those architectures. Okay. Or we can go even further that, than that, which is, like, um, like you know, modify the Flashbox architecture to work in these uh, architectures. And so it's, like, I guess my question is, what level of detail do we want for, in paper one? Yeah, I think that's also like up to you guys from my perspective, because like you said, paper one is kind of like first order engineering focused in some way, like it's describing the system. It's like kind of like a white paper, et cetera. I think the most important thing to have in there is like a things that are directly relevant to like early days. So like, for example, a lot of people will ask things like, doesn't ETH2 just get rid of this or like uh, sharding solves this or you just do optimism roll up and, uh, you know, Blah, blah, blah. So I think we'll need to answer those like practical questions of like the things people are actually doing like in the very near future. How does this affect uh, like how does it change uh, all everything we're talking about? Um, I think the longer term like fundamental theory of like what is the real difference between these systems and various chains and like how does this really like how do we think about this problem and like designing systems that doesn't have to be in paper one from my perspective and can just be like called out as like these are all unanswered questions in like future work and then we work on it separately but like none of that is set in stone so really like from my perspective i'm happy to include whatever but i think the scope of paper one is is like gonna be like kind of defending a design and uh, part of that is just like answering low hanging fruit questions about like if the system changes a little bit or if we just add like a commit reveal to the protocol whatever it might be um mm -hmm. You know, we, we kind okay. of want to say that, like, this is more fundamental than that, um, if that makes sense. Okay, so it's basically describe the chain architect, the requirements of a chain architecture in which this Flashbox design works. And then, you know, maybe we can say that there are, we know of architectures where it doesn't, but, you know, that's out of, describing those is out of scope for this paper. Yeah, pretty okay. much. Got it. Yeah, but again, like it's very open ended. So if you feel like there's something you want to say that's like out of not in that scope, that's also fine. I think we just kind of want to give some broad color to the community about why we think this is a good idea to build um, in paper one. Mm -hmm. Are you back, Tina? We're also over time, so maybe we should. Yes, I'm back. Uh, I'm all. I could hear you guys all pretty well, so. Sorry about my spotty vocal. Um, so I think everything, um, actually that's, uh, uh, I think a lot more clear um, than where we started. So um, I guess the next step is that we have another research workshop next week. Um, we haven't really dived into paper two, although authors um, separate FRP, um, 
will be the uh, the bulk of it. Also, one thing that's under addressed a little bit in the uh, current uh, paper, um, but I think Soraya is working on it uh, right now, uh, is kind of the auction uh, part, and he's done the literature review for it, and uh, or he's go going to do the literature review, and uh, so I think how what is the expectation there? Um, perhaps we want to address it a bit more in the FRP as well. So I think overall, um, let's um, um, leave it here for now. Um, perhaps uh, what um, Alejo and the Flashboss team, we will um, work on iterating and updating some of the research process for more clarity to address some of the concerns and questions raised here. And um, folks who's on the call who's already submitting FRP or is planning on submitting FRP, um, please uh, go ahead and make uh, update and changes. And uh, when you feel ready, um, uh, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, create a PR for the uh, FRP, uh, for the flash boss repo. And we'll follow up, follow up with you. Yeah, and if you guys have any meta comments, like everyone here and involved at this stage, I think is like a relatively independent senior level research, at least capable actor. So like, please send comments, especially to Tina, Alex, and me about like how we can change this process or if there's any overhead that would help you to remove and things like that. We want it to be minimal um, and like incur as little overhead as possible for organizing things. Exactly. Well, no more questions. Well, um, let's leave it here. Thank you, guys. See you guys you on the next call. See you. Thanks for taking the time.